thank you for that introduction and thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so as the title, might, title suggests, we're going to talk a little bit about computational science and also materials chemistry. I'm a chemist. I'll try to keep it more on the top. Um, and specifically where we can bring the two together. And so to begin, we want to think about, okay, well, what are nanoscale systems? What are nanomaterials? And these are basically kind of a code word for saying low dimensional materials. Something like quantum dots that are very popular in the literature for a host of applications are basically zero dimensional particles when you think on, on mesoscopic, bigger than nanometer scales. We can also have carbon nanotubes have been uh, really prevalent in the last 10 to 15 years. We've got just one kind of schematically drawn here on the bottom left. And these are systems where two of the three dimensions are confined to the nanometer scale, but then the one might be much, much longer. And then, of course, more recently, we have the graphene sheets, which just won the Nobel Prize last year, or their truncated uh, variety, the nano ribbons, which are once again a, a one-dimensional type structure. These have been receiving a lot of uh, attention in the last decade and a half or so, because they have huge synthetic variability in terms of how we can make them, how we can use them, and in particular, they have interesting mechanical and chemical properties. For instance, uh, nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, have been used for quite some time in making tennis rackets. They've found that they actually in, uh, increase the durability and stability of the rackets, and as Wilson would probably tell you, uh, also help you get that great serve. Um, also have been used for some time to make stain-resistant pants by using a nanomaterial coating to repel liquid, particularly water-based liquids, from the pants and prevent them from setting into the underlying fabric. Now, it goes without saying, then, that nanomaterials also have very distinct electronic properties. And the, this has been very, very enthusiastic and very exciting in chemistry and physics recently. And so just as an example of one thing that we can see electronically are surface effects in model lattice systems. And so if we look at what I would call a conventional read three-dimensional material, we can look at a quantity called the local density of states, which just tells you basically how many states, quantum, quantum states, you have in an energy range, uh, and look at it both in the bulk, where you're infinitely far from a surface, and then at any given layer at the surface, subsurface, second subsurface, et cetera. And so the, the take-home point here is, so in these six panels, the number in the top left tells you what layer you're at, with one being the surface, the black line is the quantity in the bulk, and the red line is the quantity at that layer. And so we can see at the surface, there's a little bit of variation. The line shapes are a little bit different, but they're not. You could approximate the one by the other, and it's probably not terrible. Uh, second layer gets a little bit better, third layer better. Basically, by the time you get to the fifth layer in these three-dimensional materials, there's not a huge amount of difference. There's a little bit of variation, but you've really recovered most of the bulk line shape. And this has been well known and well characterized for 30 years and seems to be true of just about all three-dimensional materials. Uh, whether you choose five or six or four is a little bit more arbitrary. If we then look at one-dimensional materials instead using the exact same model system, now just reducing the dimensionality, we can see that you know, the surface looks nothing like the bulk. But moreover, layer 20 doesn't really look anything like the bulk. If you can see, there is kind of the black line in the middle of this. It's tracing it out well, but you're not actually converging to it. And so the real take-home point here is that surface effects persist in nanomaterials. In particular, how far? And so what we really want to get at in this talk is going beyond these model lattice systems and really starting to add realism and look at things that people can actually synthesize and actually make and actually care about. And so from a, from a materials chemistry standpoint, uh, particularly theoretical and computational. What we're really interested in is the Green's function for the system, which is denoted with, by G, which is a function of the energy and depends numerically on the basis set overlap matrix from your favorite quantum chemistry code, and either the Hamiltonian or Fock matrix or Cohn-Sham matrix, depending on what level of theory, et cetera, that you want to go in. And so if we look at this, this basically amounts to, going to a, a computational math perspective, a large matrix inversion. If we start thinking about these systems, where we've, we've just said on the previous slide, these surface effects are persistent, very deep into the materials. We've got to have a big system to really see what does the surface do. And so, of course, this translates to a large matrix inversion. Um, I'll give the statistic now, and we'll see it maybe a little bit later. For a graphene nanoribbon system that we're gonna, we are going to see a little bit later, this matrix would be something 100,000 100, by 100,000 on that order. And so this is really not fun. Um, we can also, though, appeal to our materials chemistry and realize, though, that for most applications we're interested in, we only need certain blocks of the, of the Green's function matrix or operator, whatever word you want to put there. And so let's not waste any time calculating things that we don't ultimately care about. 
And so further appealing to our chemistry, we can use a very common principal layer approximation, which has been well, well known in complex band structure literature for 30 years, to basically take our material, and there's the graphene nano ribbon pictured here on the bottom, and break it up into units that are sufficiently big that they only really see the unit to their left or the unit to their right. And so when you do this, you can think about having some very long, elongated graphene nanoribbon where now there's this left part where we have added some hydrogen passivation at the surface on the left. We have however many of these hexagonal ring bulk units in the middle, and then we have a right unit on the other side. And so basically, if we think about our, our Hamiltonian matrix then, what we're really going to get is something that looks like this. And so the first thing that jumps out is that it's block tridiagonal and we should be able to use this, this form or this algebraic structure to help us. But the other thing is that it's nearly block toplets. If you take out the left principal layer, you take out the right principal layer, everything along, all the blocks on the diagonal are the same. All the blocks on the subdiagonal are the same. And this is also structure we should be able to use to help us in our task. And so then, now kind of making the relationship, Green's functions, principal layers, where are we going with it? Um, and I introduced this matrix M just for notational shorthand. Um, we can very easily exploit the block tridiagonal structure, this was shown 20 years ago, to get every block of the Green's function matrix block by block. Only calculate the ones you want. And what it really boils down to, so if we want to say, looking at layer N, we need to know the local information about an isolated layer N that doesn't know anything about the rest of the nanomaterial, and what we call in, in, in chemical physics the self-energy for all the left layers and a self-energy for all the right layers. And of course, the self-energy, you can think of it as open system boundary conditions. You can think of it as a sweep everything we don't care about under the rug term. Uh, you know, that's fine. Um, and so then basically following uh, this paper down here on the bottom that proposed this 20 years ago, this gives you this iterative linear scaling procedure to build up these self-energies. You start at the left layer. Once we have the left layer, which hopefully is something tractable, then we can build the next layer on top of it. Well, once we have that one, well, then we can build the next layer on top of it, and so on and so forth. And so then as we think about saying, well, there are n minus 1 layers here on the left, we do this n minus 1 times, problem solved. So this is good. We, we've seen that. They're block tridiagonal, which then gives us this linear scaling block by block method. But I haven't said anything about this nearly block toplet structure. And so let's take a look and see what we can do there. So just briefly here, I give the equation for self-energy. Don't spend any time on it. And what I want to do is make kind of a small one-slide digression into some neat mathematics that I found that was published about 15 years ago called a matrix Mobius transformation, which is exactly what it might sound like. It's the matrix generalization of the Mobius transformation from complex variables. And so what you can think is then in here, so Z is going to be an N by N matrix. Lowercase a, b, c, and d are also N by N matrices. And you can basically write the matrix Mobius transformation in this way. There are other ways to define it that I'm not going to go into. And once again, just as in complex variables, you can write the Mobius, matrix Mobius transformation as a matrix, which is now, of course, 2N by 2N. And so some of the neat properties that this retains from complex variables are, in particular, associativity in that the Mobius matrix Mobius transformation of a matrix Mobius transformation is just the Mobius transformation using the matrix product of the other two. So I hope that's clear. And so what this really allows us to do for this study is to grow these surface greens functions, which is basically this G right up here, and then M we know. That's the matrix we're given. Um, we can calculate this term right here, layer by layer, just as we did before, using this recursive relationship. And we can write that as a Mobius transformation, matrix Mobius transformation, so that we have the, everything on the left with n layers written directly in terms of everything on the left for n minus 1. Well, then, look, knowing that layer n minus 1 is the same as n minus 2 is the same as n minus 3, and so on and so forth, we can then go and use the associativity of this matrix Mobius transformation to lump all of it into one step and basically just say, here's our matrix Mobius transformation. We apply it n minus 1 times onto the Green's function for one layer, which is really easy to get, and then go on. And so this is really cool. Now, there's one small issue is that if we look at this matrix carefully, we have to invert this, this M10 matrix, which tells you how to one layer couples to either of its neighbors. And that raises the question, are these blocks singular? And so unfortunately, they're not. Um, or excuse me, they are. Careful there. 
Um, and so if we look at, once again, there's this graphene nanoribbon system we'll see at the very end, and look at the condition number of this matrix across our energy spectrum, this is the log of the condition number, which is not exactly something fairly nice. And so, you know, then we can go back and say, okay, well, in the mathematics now we're having an issue. We've got this great tool. If only we can invert this matrix. Well, let's step back to the materials chemistry side and say, does this singularity have physical meaning? Well, we can go back to complex band structure. And so sure enough, yes, it does. It represents negligible evanescent states. So these are quantum states that you come into the material and they, they exist locally and they decay very quickly. And so because of that, they tend not to contribute to any quantities that we're ever interested in. And so basically what we can do is we can approximate these states. We can then take the singular value decomposition of this singular, numerically singular matrix, raise up the, and kind of inflate the really small singular, var singular values, make the matrix numerically uh, invertible, and go on. And so with that, just to kind of summarize, we can use the, the block toplet structure to plug it into a matrix Mobius transformation. Unfortunately, we have singular coupling blocks. We can get around that using singular value inflation, which then lets us use the matrix Mobius transformation, which gives us this constant scaling block by block algorithm. It does not matter how many layers we put in the material, it will cost the same amount, which I thought was really cool. I hope you do too. And then once we have that, we can finally get at the surface effects that we've been wanting to explore. And so then, you know, very briefly here, we can then say, look at this graphene nanoribbon where there's been a picture on a couple slides. And this is a, the kind of mirror plot to what I showed you at the very beginning, where black is the bulk, red is at a particular layer. And so what we see now is 13 layers down from a surface. And this is actually a finite material now where there's two surfaces. This is 13 layers from either surface. We can see that they don't, the surface or this layer doesn't really look anything like the bulk. First of all, it's not smooth. You haven't really coalesced into bands yet. There are surface states in the band gap. All this great physics is going on. As we make the, the nanoribbon a little bit longer and say now 20 layers, or, or, or the 20th layer is at the center, getting a little bit more dense, the surface states are decaying away. And anyway, as we make them longer, we can eventually see the coalescence of all of these states into bands. And in particular, for this system, by the time you reach 1,500 layers, you're finally starting to look like the bulk. To do a little bit of unit conversion here, that's approximately 200 nanometers from a surface. So this graphene nanoribbon would have to be 400 nanometers long before you can actually really talk about bulk. Um, and that's huge, especially since the way that people have modeled these historically in the past is to either say, we're going to use a really, really small piece of the nanoribbon because that's all we can fit realistically into our favorite quantum chemistry package, or we're going to put on periodic boundary conditions and just ignore surfaces altogether. And so unfortunately, that doesn't really seem to be very good for any of these applications, especially when uh, people are thinking about using nanomaterials and batteries, they want these nanoribbons that would be 10 to 150 nanometers long. Um, so you can also look at semi-infinite systems. You see the same trends. There's not much to say there. And so there's kind of a summary. What we've done here is develop this method for calculating Green's functions and basically use this matrix Mobius transformation to make it constant scaling by combining all of these layers and using this nearly block toplet structure that people hadn't been using in the past. And with that, we can then start to look at the surface depth of nanomaterials and find that surface effects persist, which is really nice in one sense because we now have a way to look at them. But moreover, we now have a way to look at them. We could not have gotten these guys onto to, you know, even Jaguar running NW Chem using anything other than a really cruddy level of theory and a really bad basis set, if that was even possible. And so this really lets us start to get at what, are, what else do these nanomaterials have to offer us as we think about using them in exciting applications. And so I think it's fitting that I then close with some unsolicited advice, perhaps, to uh, new fellows, to old fellows, to new alumni, to old alumni, things that I've kind of picked up in the, in the four years on the fellowship. And so one of the big pieces would be, you know, when, you're, when you get confronted with your problem, whether it's on the physics side, chemistry side, science side, computer science side, math side, figure out what is your biggest problem and work on that one. You know, don't worry about, oh, well, we, these surface effects are really big. We can't get at them. And figure out what the biggest problem is. And that's, we needed to invert this really, really big matrix. Work on that. The other stuff will come. Second, you know, as a physicist, as a chemist, talk to the mathematicians and the computational scientists. They know what they're talking about. And you guys talk to us, please. Um, and that's where I ended up finding the matrix Mobius transformation that basically made all of this work possible. And also, you know, props to the CSGF for making me take all those applied math courses. You know, great. Um, 
And then second, or last, third, I should say, ask the right questions. When I first started working on this project, what we were really looking at was just a way to calculate surface greens functions for various applications, and in doing so, realized we had this something completely more that could get at all these other problems, and changed our question to say, well, what if we look at this entire surface to bulk progression in these materials to see what happens? And so with that, the obligatory acknowledgement slide to thank my advisors, Mark and Tamara at Northwestern, uh, some collaborators in Israel. Uh, I owe a huge debt of thanks to Scott Thornton, who I met on my practicum at Oak Ridge. Uh, thank you, Krell and CSGF, for all of your support and friendship. Uh, groups at Northwestern and all of you for listening to my talk. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.